Bart Ehrman, professor of New Testament at uh, Duke University, uh, he is, uh, starts his class every year on the New Testament with incoming fresh, freshmen in this way. Uh, being in the South, uh, where Christianity is sort of a cultural norm, uh, he asks the question, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And most all the kids, you know, students raise their hands. And then he asks them, hey, have you read any good popular books lately, the latest series that's come out or something famous like that? And a good bit of the kids raise their hands. And then he asks, have you read your Bible lately, in which very few of the kids raise their hands? And then as an agnostic, as an unbeliever in Jesus Christ, um, he begins to spend his time in teaching and such like that, uh, sort of deconstructing uh, historical Christian faith uh, uh, for those kids or else who listens and, and the reality is, is that what's taken place is that most, many, much of the faith in that room on that college campus is built on something other than the Word of God. It's built on the popularity of the church. It's built on family relations. It's built on, uh, on just social structure, broader social structures of friendships and such like that. It's built on tradition. But by virtue of the fact that the students haven't really been reading their Bibles, there's a disconnect then between what their faith in Christ is supposed to be about and what it's actually about. Oh, this is important for us because we've been doing a series on theology and doxology, saying that, hey, our right thinking about God, our right understanding of God, theology, leads us to right worship about God. And all of our sermons then have been sort of grounded in the Word. When we gather corporately as a church, we need to be talking about reading God's Word, praying God's Word, singing God's Word, preaching God's Word, and then lastly, today, seeing God's Word in the context of the Lord's Supper. We just uh, finished uh, our, uh, the elders in training session this morning, and, and uh, Dr. Edmund Clowney says that the, the Sunday morning worship gathering is the pinnacle of the believer's worship throughout the week, precisely because it's the gathered body that gets together to declare the good news of Jesus Christ, to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, to be refreshed and challenged and and. Uh, encouraged and sharpened, corrected. Like this is it. This is the pinnacle of it. If This is why we gather. To be a Christian just by yourself with no body around you is not how the Lord designed it. We know this uh, from his own nature, that he is a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We know this from creation because it was not good for man to be alone. So he gives, he gives Adam Eve. We know this because Abraham is made into a great nation. And we know it all throughout the scriptures because the Lord's dealing with the people of Israel, which leads into the New Testament. Christ and the church, and it culminates in Revelation where we're all gathering the, the Word of God. The church is the body, it's the people of God. So this, this every Sunday is a foretaste of glory divine. It's what's to come. It's not perfect. We're a bunch of sinners, all messed up, not doing anything perfectly, but, but, but it's the pinnacle of our week because we see the people we're going to spend eternity with, and we want to do some of the things that we are going to do in eternity. Praise God. Amen. So, let's, so, so you have been hopefully uh, saturated with the word thus far, but let's, let's, let me go back for the sake of the Lord's Supper and sort of uh, tell the story of what you just read a few minutes ago with TJ. See, God's people were saved from famine by Joseph, Jacob's son, by becoming in charge of all of Egypt just under the Pharaoh. And the 75 Israelites moved from their land into Egypt and to keep from starving. Fast forward 400 years later, and that, that same small 75 people now grow into millions. With Joseph long forgotten, 
by the current Pharaoh, and the current Pharaoh is, 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 has enslaved all the Israelites in order to build his own kingdom. So the Lord then meets Moses at Mount, at Mount Horeb in the burning bush, a bush that's burning but not consumed. And the Lord tells him that he is going to be the one, the Lord's heard the cries of his people, and that Moses is going to be the one to lead them out of Egypt into a land that he would give them. So Moses then, uh, on the authority of God, goes and tells Pharaoh that the Lord commands Pharaoh to let the Israelites go or great plagues are going to come. And if you're familiar with the story, uh, Pharaoh says, Hey, your God's not my God. Have your way. So here come the plagues, right? The water turns into blood in the Nile River. You got frogs and gnats and flies that cover all the land. Livestock dies. People get sick with boils. And hail comes down like it's never been seen before and destroys man and beast and every plant and every tree of the field. If that's not enough, Locusts follow behind that and they eat everything that's left over while the ninth plague has the darkness uh, covering the land where everyone is literally still for three days because they can't see where they're going or who they see. This is what's taking place because the Lord is trying, while plagues are terrible, the Lord is trying to be merciful and saying, hey, just let my people go. Repent, turn your heart, Pharaoh, just stop enslaving my people. And he refuses. But it's the 10th plague that is most important to us today as we think about the Lord's Supper or called communion or sometimes you've heard it called Eucharist, literally meaning a meal of thanksgiving, the Eucharist. But we're going to choose, I'm going to choose Lord's Supper primarily and I might sneak some communions in there as I go throughout the morning, okay? But the 10th plague the final plague was to actually take the life of every firstborn in Egypt, from the son of Pharaoh to the firstborn of all the cattle. So on that night, when the, when the Lord was going to come and fulfill the promise of the plague, the Lord instructed his people through Moses to take a lamb that was without blemish and sacrifice the lamb at twilight, just like you read. They were then to take that blood and put it on two doorposts, and then you read to put it on the lintel. Uh, that's not a bean. Uh, that's, the over, that's the cross beam of the door. So they're putting the, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and across the top of the door. And, and then as they did that, they were going to roast the sacrifice, and eat what they could and burn the rest. And they're going to do this in haste, the Scripture describes. They're fully dressed for their departure. They have their sandals on their feet, and their staff is in their hands. You don't eat this way now. They didn't eat that way back then. This is very specific to what the Lord was about to do. And then God goes ahead and gives instructions that they're going to memorialize this night with the feast of what we now call the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or as you know it as Passover. Same thing. And God, who is true to his word, his promise, struck down all of Egypt's firstborn. He spared all the Israelites' firstborn who followed his instructions about the sacrifice and the doorposts and the meal. And he literally led the people out of Egypt, his people, out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He miraculously parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to walk across on dry land when the Pharaoh's army was bearing down on them. And he miraculously closed the Red Sea on the Egyptian army to, in order to spare the Israelites from destruction. And this is the beginning then of a wilderness journey to the promised land that was promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So why is this so important to the Lord's Supper? What does Exodus and the Exodus have to do with this? Well, I'm going to answer the question with a question. Where, what were Jesus and the disciples doing when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper? That's exactly right, church. 
They were celebrating the feast of unleavened bread. They were celebrating Passover. You have to have that in your mind when you're thinking about communion. So I want you this morning at home and here, I want you to allow your heart and mind to take in the next words, which you've already heard, but take them in again with this Passover meal in mind, this sacrifice of lamb, this this painting of blood, this sharing of meal before the Exodus event. Listen to Jesus' words again. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, Jesus said, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is God's word. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. He is the better Passover lamb, the perfect Passover lamb. Israel ate the lamb and celebrated with unleavened bread. Israel painted the blood on the door so that God would pass over and no death would come to them. But now his disciples would would take from him and pass along a new meaning to this ancient feast. That Jesus is the truest lamb that was slain. That his body was sacrificed on the cross for you and for me. And his blood was the fulfillment of the covenant that not only passes over us, makes death pass over us, but it preserves us from death and promises a pure heart with which God, which we get to dwell with God forever. This is what's going again. So, Ask me again why we take communion. (laughs) Man, we take it because it is the picture of salvation. Christ died for you. Uh, It's it's exactly what uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11. He breaks it down for us because... Because he says, hey, as often as you do this, right? When Paul quotes what Jesus was saying, is as often as you drink it, you do this in remembrance of me. So, so we take the Lord's Supper in order to remember what Christ has done for us. This is the reason Jesus gives us in Luke. You do this in remembrance of me. What are we remembering? Just what we read. Christ's body broken and his blood spilled for the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are removed. The penalty of your sin, not that you become perfect in this life, but that you share in Christ's righteousness because he has removed your sin and given you his life. We're remembering that. And we also, we, that we drink the cup, right? To know that blood was spilled for us. It's also to be reminded that he does not drink of this cup until we are with him in his Father's kingdom. There's a future glory to come. When we take communion, I don't know if you think about that very often when you take communion at this church, but there's, we need to think about, whoa, the, the Lord is waiting to share this with us in perfection in a day to come. I have a future hope for what's going to happen. I remember Christ's death I remember his sacrifice. I'm reminded that his blood forgives my sin. And I remember that I will be with him in eternity drinking this new communion wine. The the second reason 
why we are going to take this is because, because there's a proclamation to it. It's not only we remember something, but we're now saying something. And we get this from 1 Corinthians 11, which again, we'll read the, the whole passage fully toward the end of the sermon. But, but verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, now we're in a church that's predominantly full of believers, so who are we proclaiming it to? We're proclaiming it to each other. We're, we're telling each other, hey, this is real, this is true, and, and I still believe this. And when you take it, you tell me, hey, I still believe this. This is in my heart, it's in my life, and it's a, it's a place. This is why in some sense, while you're remembering something that is, that is a terrible day, right? Death of Christ, spilling of his blood. There's also a sense of celebration to it because as, as the word Eucharist prescribes, it's a meal of thanksgiving because the Lord did this on our behalf. And so when we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim it to each other predominantly. We're so thankful for that. And, and we're encouraged, right? I know a lot of times we have our heads bowed, our eyes closed, we're thinking about things, and we should. But sometimes you should also just look up and look around. Look at your brothers and sisters taking it and being like, amen, amen. I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. These are my brothers and my sisters. We're going to do this for eternity together, but we're going to practice right now. It's good. And, and, then, and then we also proclaim it uh, to those who would attend with us who are not believers. People would see what we're doing, and, and we, you'll hear the language toward the end. You'll, we, we ask those who are not believers to not participate in the meal because they need to consider rightly what this meal means, and they don't yet confess it. They don't, they don't yet believe it. They don't profess that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. So, so we say, hey, don't take this because the Scripture says you shouldn't take this. But as we participate in it as a family, those who are not part of our spiritual family, they see it, and it's a proclamation to them. They're like, oh, these people believe this. They're willing to get up and move to the table. They're willing to receive the plate and take it. They're willing to consider their lives and confess their sins to the Lord God Almighty, and they want to take it. So, so we're not only remembering, but we're proclaiming it. There's a, there's a third reason. I read this great article this week that I'm going to share um, at the Theological Thursday, that, that email we sent out on Thursdays. Be sure to, it's, it's, a, it's a longer article, but it's very, very readable. I thought it was really, really good. But it's, it's also, we take it because it's, a, it's, it's, it's about war, and repentance. Listen to, look at and listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. That's, that's the picture of the Exodus. And all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. This is what the Lord has given them in the desert. For they drank from the spiritual rock that, that followed them, and the rock was Christ. N nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Th their unbelief, their lack of faith in the wilderness, a whole generation dies. Now these things took place as examples for us. They're examples that we might not desire evil as they did. The golden calf. The unbelief. Then, then down eight verses, and in, in verses that, that's one through six, but look at 14 through 17. It says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look, this meal we're taking is reminding us that we are live in a war, a spiritual battle by which Christ has led us through, is leading us through, so that, so that we might be humbled that he would deliver us, we might be aware of our own sin that wants to go away from it, and we might repent to the Lord to say, Lord, we're sorry for our waywardness. Lord, please forgive us by your body and by your blood. For the Christian is simultaneously humbling that Christ has to be sacrificed on our behalf 
while we also have this anticipatory joy for the day we drink with him in this very meal, in the deepest, most fulfilled understanding we could ever possibly imagine. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. Remembrance, proclamation, and a place of of acknowledging the battle and repenting and staying close to Jesus. So here's another question. That's why we should take it. Then who should take the Lord's Supper? And the answer would be those who are Christian, those who are truly saved, that those who are converted from death to life, who believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the only Savior of the world, and those who believe that Jesus has saved them from death to life and that he's the only person that could save them. Uh, uh, more so, who should take it? The, the Christian should generally or regularly take it in the context of a local body that they are in covenant membership with. Now, this is not always possible, but it should be regularly true. You should be able to take it in the context of the local body that you're most affiliated with, that you're in membership with, people who know your life, people that, uh, that, that encourage you, that they correct you. They, 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 we're doing it as a family. Uh, to, uh, if, if, if this is the pinnacle of worship, right, us, uh, uh, of our weekly worship, right, the getting together, then taking the Lord's Supper by yourself or in a small group or uh, just, you, you know, you're not really part of a church. You just go to a bunch of different churches your whole life and you just take it whenever they have it. It's, it's not really the intention of the, ch- of the church. It's not the, it's not the point for the Lord's Supper. It's to be, it, it, there is a universality to the church, so you can take it in other places, other congregations. But most of the scripture, when it mentions the word church, is talking about the local, gathered, covenant relation body. So you want to take it in the context of this as most as you come together. Uh, first, and, and again, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, when you come together, he says it's not for the better, for the worse. He's correcting them. One eighteen. when you come together, there are divisions. That's the worst he's talking about. Uh, for, uh, 11.20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. They're doing something wrong. He's, again, he's correcting them. 1 Corinthians 11, 33 and 34, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Uh, when we come together is when we is, is who should be taking the meal, the local body together. Um, this, this is helpful for us. Uh, I, I, need to, I need to do some pastoral humility right here. Um, I was trying to help us prepare for uh, taking communion today, and I pulled a, a letter, an email sent out when we took communion together virtually on Zoom from, uh, uh, from Good Friday of last year. And I thought, well, we wrote this. Uh, we have people who are online. Uh, the elders have read this. We're good. And we sent it out. And then I got emails back from members of our church uh, going, hey, I'm not sure this is so right. And we're like, oh, yeah, maybe it's, I, I, maybe it's not. And so I want, to be, uh, I, want to, I want to shore that up so we're clear about who's taking communion. Because you can sort of parse out communion in this way. Uh, some churches practice a closed communion, meaning only the, the formal membership of the church can receive communion. Only those who are members of this particular only body could, could do it. We don't practice it that way. Um, you can also have a close communion, and that means that all those who have been baptized by immersion in believer's baptism, right? I got saved, then I got baptized Those are the ones who can take the communion, the Lord's Supper, in this particular church. The third category is an open communion, and that is all those who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord uh, are welcome to take it at our table as long as they uh, can can testify that they are walking with the Lord um, in the context of a local body someplace, sometime. This is what you should be doing. And so that is who can take the Lord's Supper at our church. 
Um, uh, that, that allows um, a, a traveling Presbyterian brother or sister to come through and sit down and they can share the meal with us. We acknowledge their Christianity, their faith in the Lord. That's, that's just fine. That allows your family members to come as long as they're walking with the Lord um, and they're in good fellowship with the local body. That allows them to do that. Um, but So that's, that's who will be taking the communion this morning here at our church. Closed, closed, and open. We're open in that. In that sense, we're open. Um, uh, we want to be clear, too, and we'll say the other thing. Uh, Non-Christians, again, should not take it. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29. For anyone who eats and drinks without a discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on themselves. So we don't want non-Christians to take the meal, not because we're mean, not because we want to call you out, but because the Scriptures command it. We also wouldn't want somebody who's professing to be a Christian, who we're confident is Christian, but they're not reconciled to the body. That's the context of 1 Corinthians 11. The church is gathering, and yet they're having troubles about who's eating the meal and how they're eating the meal, and people are eating full meals, and they're not, they're not really establishing the Lord's Supper, but they're leaving out the poor, and there's all this craziness going on. And Paul's like, you've got division among you, and this is not how the Lord's Supper should be taken. You cannot take it in an unworthy manner. So we want those who are followers of Christ, who are living rightly before the Lord, to take it. Those who, are, who have problems or beef with their brothers and sisters and they're not reconciled, you should not take the Lord's Supper. If you're not a professing Christian, you should not take the Lord's Supper. Rather, you should come to our church every Sunday. Every Sunday you should come. Believer, non-believer, you should come every single Sunday. Never, don't, don't miss. Just come all the time and just keep singing with us and listen to the Word of God and ask questions. And if you're unreconciled to somebody, then reconcile to someone who you're unreconciled with. But, what, but do that until, until the Lord like, shows you, like, oh, you're a great sinner and He's the great Savior. He died on the cross for you and you need to be saved. Then, then we'll welcome you with open arms. Then you would take the table. You would take the bread and take the cup. And you would be, you'd, have, you'd know that same joy and encouragement that our brothers and sisters know in the context of this, of this congregation. Third question, how should we take communion? Very, uh, mostly practical, I think. There's some, there, people will try to put some theological implications to it, and I understand what they're doing. Uh, sometimes in our church, historically, we have passed the plate. Right, that's sort of that's how I grew up doing it in my church. Uh, that's how we've done it here uh, uh, for a long season. We uh, people come, typically the deacons, and they sort of and they go down the aisles. We pass the plate. You pick a piece of bread. You hold it. We all then we all take it together. Same with the cup. Um, uh, the idea here is is service, and that people are serving one in the Word of God. Uh, the, the the presence of God is is sort of coming to you in that sense. Uh, we're shepherding each other uh, by by sharing in this meal and such like that. Uh, we also, in the last, in the last few years, uh, we've instituted that sometimes you walk to the table, right? We put, it, we put tables around the sanctuary, and we uh, do our time of uh, sort of confession and repentance, and then when you're ready and your heart's ready and right, you come to the table and you grab uh, the bread and the cup yourself, and then we, uh, and you take it back to your pew, and then we take it all together because we want to take it, the meal together. Um, uh, the, and the idea is that we are coming to the table. We're coming together. Um, there's other ways to do it. Um, I, I would. Uh, I, this is this is me sort of speaking on my own as an idea. It's not. This is nothing the elders have mandated like that. But I. I but we have. Um, I, I would like to try it someday in the context of our worship, where you are coming to the elders, and the elders have the cup and the bread, and you can just take the bread and dip it in the cup, and you can take it right then, and 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 the elders have an opportunity to say just to speak. God's truth into your mind and your heart by just by saying, this is Christ's body and blood broken and shed for you. Take and eat. And then you take it. Um, it's not, it doesn't have the same necessarily corporate aspect to it as everybody doing it simultaneously, but I think there's something valuable there as far as just shepherding the flock and fencing the table and, and just coming in counter uh, with one, one brother and sister to another. Um, I, I think, I, I, I like the idea that elders doing it. I, I think Anybody in the church who's walking with the Lord and it's their, their walk with the Lord is mature and right, they could also do the same thing, I think. But that's for more conversation, but you might see that. So, um, you know, be, you, might, you might expect that in days to come. Um, 
nothing crazy. We, we won't get any, you know, we're not going to do any, you know, there's no game show, communion, or anything like that. We're not going to have anything crazy, but uh, we might try some different things. Um, and the question then is, w- when should we take it? Like with, with sort of what frequency do we take it? Um, let me see if I can spell it out like this. Historically, the church has taken it every single Lord's Day most of its life. That's, that's, that's church history. We've taken it every single Sunday for most of its life. And there seems to be some reasons why this has changed to sort of monthly and quarterly or however other, any other church does it in the life of their local congregation. Uh, one reason is just sort of the, the theology of it. Right in part, it was in part it was taken weekly because the theology behind it, especially before the Protestant Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church, was just the doctrine of transubstantiation, where the the the, the priest actually blessed it, and when the priest blessed it, the substance of it changed into Christ's actual body and blood, and they took and ate Christ's body and blood. This was the doctrine, and if that if that's what it was, it would sort of in, you know heighten the uh, the importance of what you were doing. Uh, when the when the when the Reformation came, you got a couple of different uh, meanings of the Lord's Supper. Uh, that the the reformers rejected transubstantiation, but uh, a guy like Luther, Martin Luther, uh, he he believed in consubstantiation, where the the substance, the physical elements didn't change, but the essence of what it was changed. The essence of it became Christ's body and blood. And again, heightening the thing. And then we have uh, uh, Heinrich Zwingli, also one of Luther's contemporaries, and he believes in, a, in, a, in a, like a, a memorialism, right? Like it's, it's, it's this deep, meaningful symbol that the Lord commands us to do. Nothing actually transfers uh, in essence or in substance of the elements, uh, but rather we just, we're just reminded of it. We're, we reflect on it. All the things we just said earlier about it would be true for it. Um, so, so if, if you actually, if you go from transubstantiation to memorialism, there might be a, a sense in our hearts and minds where it just becomes less important and the requirement for taking it weekly doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. We can just sort of do it when we need to remember stuff. When we preach the word every day, right? We, we, we sing the songs all the time. We pray prayers every week. So, you know, let's just, you know, it's, it's okay if we do this less and less. Um, there's also an element to where uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Catholic doctrines, the, the sacraments, Right, the Catholic doctrine has seven sacraments. Uh, they are means of grace, and by their definition of means of grace, it's it's it actually is a way to merit Christ's salvation, to merit Christ's grace in your life. Um, we don't confess that. We believe it's salvation by grace through faith. That's how we get salvation, not because of the works we do. We're built for good works. We respond with good works, but we don't, we don't earn Christ's favor. And so if uh, maybe, maybe potentially as a reaction to this sort of theology going, well, this isn't necessarily true, um, again, the importance might seem to wane, so we don't take, maybe take it quite as often because we don't, we don't have to have it to be saved in that, in that sense. So there's sort, of, there's sort of theological reasons that maybe have lessened the importance of it. Uh, there's also some, some, some pragmatic reasons uh, that is taken with that. Uh, our, our Western society is just more pragmatic, and it just takes more time to do it. Revivalism in the Western culture uh, did away with a lot of liturgy. And the idea was let's just gather and let's pray and sing and preach and let's see souls get saved. And as we move across the western United States, as revival happens and, and movements take place, this is really all you need. You don't need uh, things from the past. You don't need uh, the theology of that past. You just need Jesus need to be saved. Uh, potentially, it's not overly pragmatic right if you're if you're if you're moving from east to west in our culture and our society just to pack um, to pack a bunch of communion wine and unleavened bread and take it with you is not one of the necessities you need to make it on the wild frontier so you just didn't take it right like well, we can, we have the bible and that's all we need so we just don't have that stuff to do it with potentially but there seems to be this this movement away from it uh, in order to in order just to focus on the main things and I, and I just want to, t- and, and, and quite honestly, church, um, I, I, I've spent most of my life in that sort of vein. I have grown up in Protestant churches that practice taking the Lord's Supper 
either, either quarterly or monthly. For one reason or another, I don't really know what those, those decisions were. I was too young to be a part of those conversations. I just followed my leadership. But as, as I've read and reread the scriptures, and as I've listened to these lectures that, I've, that you've, I've been sharing with you week in and week out, as the eldership has been talking about these things, we think that, that it's a good time to recapture the importance of seeing the word. We read it, we pray it, we preach it, we sing it. But now we have an opportunity every week to remember and proclaim. Every week to be encouraged. Every week to be humbled. Every week to, to, to be reminded of the war that we have and, and the repentance that can come from just, yes, my, my sin's overwhelming. Every week this would be a good idea. In, in fact, if you just take the whole Bible, it's really hard to do Christianity without food. It's really difficult. And, and I got this straight from the lecture. You can read it. I, 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 Tony um, uh, Marita uh, gave, us, gave, gave me this, and I'm just, I'm just borrowing it or using it, or however you want to call it. I'd like to think it's not stealing. It's one of the big ten. I don't want to sin while I'm in the pulpit. It's, it's, not, it's no good. But, but when, when God created Adam and Eve, it was in a garden, and the whole deal was around what you could and could not eat in the garden. They could eat everything, just except for the one tree, but it, it, there, was, there was plenty for them to eat. Oh, we, we just talked about the, the Exodus event is remembered by a meal. You, re, you, you taste the bitterness of the wilderness. You remember the lamb who was slain. When they're in the wilderness, they have manna from heaven. The Lord is giving them manna and quail. They're, they're getting water from a rock. It's, it's around this food. The, their sin, their sin in part in the wilderness was complaining that they didn't have the food of Egypt. You should have just left us in Egypt. We could have eaten better. But where's the Lord taking them to? The promised land. Well, how's that described? Oh, oh, it's a land flowing with what, church? Milk and honey. There's food right there. If you follow Jesus' life, Jesus is always eating. He's either going to or coming from a meal. In fact, Luke 7 says the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Right? It's what he's doing. He's with the people. He's in fellowship. He's in relationship. He's sharing meals with lost and saved alike. And then he institutes a meal to remember his death and the meaning of it. The, the Lord's Supper takes us home into his presence, into the future glories like no other meal possibly can. We were made for the table. We were made for fellowship. We were made for hospitality. And the Lord's Supper helps us to taste the humility and the hope that's found in Jesus Christ.